three. Two. Sam, unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Oh, great. Welcome, everyone. And uh, Thanks for making time to be in this. Sorry, we're running a few minutes into the time. I, I trust we'll try and catch up. Uh, I want to welcome the panelists, uh, really a global team here. Uh, Dr. Merlis, uh, Claudia, all the way from Brazil in Sao Paulo. Uh, welcome. Uh, we really want to benefit from your experience uh, in public health and sanitation work in a great big city like you have. I know quite a mix of population. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Aureli, uh, Kevin, all the way from Barcelona in Spain. Uh, we want to believe your experience working in over 50 countries will be useful. I know there's not been COVID-19 before, but for sure there's something we can learn, including on how to work on matters, uh, epidemiology or addressing pandemics. Uh, welcome, Dr. Francis Olo. Uh, we very definitely, data now means a lot to everyone and we would want to uh, pick your brains on what, what then does all this matter. Thank you, Jennifer and um, Total News and the crew. Uh, I, I want to believe we can share that link, including to other people so that they can be able to ask questions as, as there will be need. Uh, and of course, to our friend at the back there, Alexis or in Paris. Let me begin with the first question. Uh, and, and of course, data here means a lot. Uh, Dr. Law, I, I think you can help us just understand what are, we, what are you observing, especially with your expertise in spatial data? What are you observing and what does it tell us? Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much, Sam, for the introduction. Uh, I think what, every, uh, what has happened now is that everyone is following up on uh, the news and the numbers. And I think from my end, I want to talk about the geography of the numbers that we have seen. Uh, we all, from the news, we know that the virus started from uh, China and the epicenter changed to Europe, uh, in Italy, Spain, and now it's in America. So we can see a special pattern in the way this uh, virus is moving. And so the question is, uh, how is it moving? So what we already know is that it moves by contact. So there's uh, the, the contact between people, but in the, then it also moves by the mobility patterns of people. And uh, in, the virus started in a time when there was a lot of uh, tu tourist travel. And this was a problem because then it means that when the tourists went home or when there was news and now people start going back home, they take the virus home. And the other thing that we know about the spatial, uh, the spatial data is that in places that have high densities, then you have a problem, high densities of people, then you have a problem. Uh, two days or three days ago, the news that was coming from New York is that although we are given that in New York now they have more than 100,000 cases as, as, as New York, but there are special differences in terms of, of, of the, the effect when you look at air, the special vulnerabilities, areas that have high, uh, that have low income, have high densities of people with low income, these areas seem to be having a problem. And I think this kind of spatial information should help us, especially now when you want to think about uh, the developing countries, because you have high densities in developing countries, you have vulnerabilities, you have inequalities. So this is a kind of thought that now we should learn from what, what has happened globally to, uh, to address it in the developing world. Thank you. Building on what on what you've mentioned, especially the differences that are being observed, including in in the U.S., um, could could there be still an impact around the travel issues, or is there something we are noticing that now comes to community level uh, co-infection? Yeah. So 
like most of the developing countries are in the global south. The virus started miles away and now it is in, in, our, in our doorsteps. The reason why it is in our doorsteps is because of the global travels. And I know now the global travels have been limited, but it is home. So our public transport is now a mode of, of, of transmission. Uh, the way we socialize is also a mode of transmission. And I think when we come to Africa, one thing that Africa and to the developing world, one thing that we need to think about are the statistics. You have high population densities. You have 40% uh, of, of people in sub-Saharan Africa are living below poverty, the poverty line. So you have people who have to, they, they have to basically work, work on a daily basis to feed themselves. So it means they'll continue wanting to go to work. So this is the, this is the kind of uh, scenario that we find ourselves in. And it, it therefore calls us to act urgently uh, and the other thing also, when you look at the global, the, the global uh, scenario, this, data is, this virus is not choosing on who to attack. High income countries have been ad attacked. Although they have better health care, they've still been attacked properly. So it is a call to act fast to save uh, developing countries which do not have equal amounts of income and which do not also have the kind of healthcare that we have in the developed world. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Law. Um, maybe this is a good point to call in uh, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Kevin, in your understanding of what it takes to address uh, pandemics, because WHO has already declared this a pandemic, is, is there some things that one must think about to manage pandemics at minimum requirement. No, thank you, Samuel. Um, yes, the, 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 the basic principles, the basic logical principles of trying to contain an epidemic are really pretty simple and straightforward. The devil, of course, is in the detail and they vary, those principles vary in how they're applied depending upon what the agent is that they're being applied to. The principles are basically try to minimize the spread by identifying how it's being spread and to whom and trying to minimize contact between people. And the second one is trying to minimize the consequences by providing treatment to those people who are already infected. The complication is that uh, this is already a very difficult virus to deal with. We know, for instance, that respiratory transmission takes place very easily through coughs or sneezes. And increasingly, it's even believed that even through speaking, through micro droplets that are transmitted when people are speaking uh, are sufficient to cause infections in other people. There's also the problem that really complicates things with this, which is asymptomatic carriage. People can appear and feel quite healthy, but they can be viremic and they can be shedding virus during that entire time. So while they're not aware that they're doing, that they're posing a threat to other people and they themselves are not sick, any contact between them and particular people who are particularly vulnerable to the infection is really a major threat. And then in addition to that is the fact that while um, if people don't feel that they're infected, then it's very difficult to try to get them to practice the social distancing, which is what's being recommended. The other issue with um, can try to contain pandemics, of course, is how to treat patients once they do become infected. It was, in the case of SARS, it was, it was uh, an easier challenge because people didn't become particularly infectious until they were very, very sick. So they're primarily posing a threat to healthcare workers at that point. And most healthcare workers were able to use the protective equipment that they needed to protect, for, to protect themselves. In this case, however, most people when they are viremic long before they need hospitalization. And then when they do need hospitalization, they can be very sick with a profound pneumonia that requires uh, ventilator support. And um, they, the, 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 the pattern has been seen in Italy and Spain, and now increasingly in the United States as well, in, in New York, as Francis was just saying, is that healthcare systems are suddenly overwhelmed. Now, this isn't some of the best provided the most heavily funded healthcare systems in the world. The system in Northern Italy was probably one of the best systems in, in, uh, in Europe and it nearly collapsed underneath it. In fact, it did collapse underneath this sudden onset of all these cases needing enormous levels of, of, prevent, of uh, treatment care. 
And so the other issue is that the social distancing, which is being recommended, which WHO has recommended and others have recommended, which is now currently affecting nearly a quarter of the world's population, is an attempt to limit that spread and to prevent the overrunning of the resources in healthcare settings. But it doesn't work very well in settings where people aren't able to work from home, as has been recommended. As Francis was pointing out, there are lots of people who don't work from home. They have to work from the streets. That's where they earn their daily, in, their, their daily uh, support in their daily food. So the idea that we can social distance, maintain the social distance while trying to maintain the basic elements that we need for life in settings like uh, low income countries is really something of a myth and it creates enormous social disparities. We're already seeing in the United States, for instance, that the majority of the deaths are taking place in low income, low income areas. Francis was talking about the spread in those areas, but it's also the deaths in those areas. So people in low income areas who've got more pre-existing health conditions are more likely to be dying from this. So it's, a, it's an issue that is extraordinarily complicated when we think about what happens in low income countries. Thank you. Thank you for really uh, detailed uh, consideration that should be made. And uh, we want to compile this and hopefully have a checklist for every country in the, in the low income setting. But perhaps then with, with that understanding, if, if you are to be asked, uh, Prof, that what would be the priority things to be done, uh, you know, to, to address this matter, what would you say at minimum, please, please, this is what I'm seeing happening and this is the gap. I my number one message is that we need to focus on social justice. The standard methods that are used to contain epidemics don't work very well in the absence of social justice. We've learned a number of, of lessons from other epidemics in settings in Africa, for instance. And um, we know, for instance, that you need to engage local authorities early because local authorities can be an effective barrier to any kind of prevention activities that might be take, undertaken in their communities. If they don't have the accurate message and if they're not on board, they can block things. We also need to understand that the affected communities have other important priorities. And in this case, as Francis was pointing out and as I just mentioned, eating is one of those important priorities. And we need to involve a broad spectrum of society, not just governments, because governments, I'm, I'm afraid, and this is not an African problem only, but governments can be fairly authoritarian in their response to this epidemic. And we don't want uh, them to be, uh, we've already seen examples in some places in, uh, in Uganda and in South Africa and in India where people who are being uh, shooed away through social distancing are being abused in the process. And we don't want that to happen. So I have a, a deep abiding fear that there are some elements in all societies who would rather that poor people die of starvation than die of COVID-19 because at least starvation is not an infectious problem. It's not a contagious issue. So I think we need to most importantly campaign for social justice and the responses that we try to undertake. Wow, that, that, that's really important. I would want us to come back to it perhaps uh, when we've heard from the other panelists, because I, I believe this is a, a dilemma between uh, how you promote both livelihoods and, and lives. And what you're saying is from a social justice point, there is no saying that one of those is more important than the other. Yeah, uh, and I perhaps agree. from a human rights point or from a governance point, perhaps those who are not daily affected by hunger may not think about livelihoods. And, and I think it's a, then a good point to really bring in uh, Claudia. Uh, Claudia, from, from your experience uh, in Brazil, uh, and uh, I don't know how much you're allowed to say this, but because from the global point, we hear that, uh, uh, at least from the president's point in Brazil, mm -hmm. that perhaps it's not seen as that much of a challenge in terms of addressing the risk of infection as much as addressing the risk of people going hungry. But then from your own point as a practitioner, and if you're able to answer the other perspective of what's happening in Brazil, what have you observed as the challenges in addressing this in Sao Paulo uh, in low-income setting? 
Hi. Um, I'm so sorry because my English is not good. I would like to share some slides uh, with point of views to respond well. Can I? A minute, please. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Well, let me talk something. <laughs> Our president is so complicated for us too. Uh, but uh, we have uh, a lot of professionals involved with COVID-19. But uh, the first point, health professionals are not ready to face the pandemic. Uh, the relationship between care and health surveillance is fragile and insufficient. There is a shortage of medical professionals in areas of so social vulnerability. Um, it's necessary to train the health professionals quickly and guarantee access to mandatory personal protective equipment for COVID-19. It's so difficult to work without them. Just behind the wave of confirmed case in Sao Paulo, in the population comes a second wave of dismissal from work of health professionals that are suspect or confirmed case of the disease. And this hinders the response to the pandemic. In Brazil, we have to provide supplemental health care for payers. There was an initial mismatch with, uh, in the exchange of information between the private and the public sector. The expansion of the health network is already happening, but it's timid in the view of the needs for the expat scenario. And, uh, we are betting high on organization primary care health uh, as the access door to the healthcare, networking, uh, monitoring surveillance, and guaranteeing supplies uh, for treatment of COVID-19 mute case. Primary care works can also be training to the first response quickly to critically will patients through the predeterminate referral pathway. Uh, the challenges go beyond the healthy wall. Uh, we have social care, health-related education, and social determinal, uh, determinants of health. Uh, to think about, I think that um, the decision uh, made on the coming weeks are likely to reshape the world, not only the health systems, but our economy, our culture, our politics. Society today is ruled by the health, wealth of the few and the brutal dehumanization of many of inequality have been accepted as something inevitable and impossible to change. Uh, we are in trouble here. Uh, our president is not, um, uh, he, is not believing in the facts and the science. It's so difficult for us in health. So then. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for pointing out that. Uh, I would want to maybe, if you can strengthen your opinion on what is working, because that, that really will help us understand what's working in Brazil. Uh, uh, here in Brazil, we have uh, a free system and public system of uh, health, uh, SUS, Unified Health System, uh, since 1988. It's a, a, a great goal to the health. Um, um, yeah, uh, beyond the, our president, it, it's our. Uh, then there is in the constitution of Brazil. It's for uh, everybody. Uh, here, 
the main one of le uh, is legal support so that Ministry of Health, State and Municipal Health Department have the necessary political governance and agility in action. There are laws recognizing pandem pandemic, public health emergency, public calamity, quarantine, preserving public service and essential activities, allowing tax breaks, etc. In Brazil, many states, we have 27 states uh, with different uh, people uh, adopted quarantine and social isolation and the resolution, the pandemic engages a larger scope than healthcare. Healthcare is protagonist, but there, there are other actors and scenarios that influence the success of health strategy, economy, justice, public security, education, development, uh, etc. Health in, in initiatives. Uh, we have evolution of assistance networking, financial for expansion for hospital beds, uh, intensive care beds, field hospitals, equipment, supplies and laboratory tests, including private uh, initiatives. Chloroquine is, uh, is the new good idea for you patients. Uh, it's paying the access to diagnostic tests, introducing the rapid tests. Uh, primary health care have to be strong here. Purchasing of equipment and personal protective equipment. Like this, we have to use all the time uh, on the streets, uh, at the work, at the essential activities. We have to have. Um, and we have uh, currently initia initiatives beyond the health, like when uh, we are talking about protection of employment and the workers, salaries in order to avoid dismissals, allowing flexibility in working relationships and guarantee a minimum income for informal works. Here in Brazil, we have 11.9 employed and 38.4 million informal workers. So many people. Suspensions of a class in the school and the university are uh, learned to us how could, could we change the way to teach and learning again. And we have to uh, have a good attention for this. Um, governments should take a social protection, ensure school meals, spend the surveillance of domestic violence, it's a great problem in Brazil. Uh, donation food and hygiene products to communities in need, partnership with the private sector, social mapping, mass information, provision of shelter uh, and water, protective measures for prison population. Articulation with industrial sectors capable to supply the materials and equipment need to face the pandemic, such as mechanical ventilators, masks, gloves, alcohol, disinfector products, creating growth and new jobs in this sector. Thank I you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've mentioned something that I, I just want to make a follow up on because it's a conversation here in Kenya. Uh, I think I've just seen some information that all health workers will now need to be tested of COVID because uh, I think the initial screening process when someone walks in did not make it really practical for most uh, healthcare workers to protect themselves. Is that what you're doing or what have you done to support the healthcare workers to remain safe? Uh, we don't have uh, any response for that. The uh, rapid test is coming now. Um, the other test is only to patients in hospital. 
in, the, uh, in intensive care. We have a subnotification about uh, COVID-19. Uh, our uh, situation is um, uh, preoccupied. It's, not, it's not real. It's not real. The not now. The numbers are not. It's not. It's not, it's not, it's not enough. The, yeah. numbers that the number show. is not enough to sh uh, to uh, show uh, to the world what's happening in Brazil. Uh, not now. We are we, we are um, waiting for the rapid test for uh, spread to the population. Can uh, you understand me? Okay. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. Sorry for very my bad good. English. <laughs> very good impression. input. B before I get Oscar uh, on board, who is our panelist uh, from uh, Zambia? I think we need to move him from being an attendee to a panelist. Maybe I want to invite uh, Francis or Kevin, uh, Jennifer, any reaction to this in terms of yeah, okay, so I, I think the, the points that uh, have been made are very good. I, I just wanted to bring it out clearly that from geographic characteristics like population density, inequalities in, in income or access to healthcare, vulnerability in terms of age and other ailments can fuel or even uh, cause the impact of this virus to be, to, to, to be, to be more severe. The other thing that I want to say is uh, no, there's no strategy that fits every country. So I know now what people are talking about is lockdown. Uh, uh, what I want to say is no strategy, no one strategy fits every country. Good examples that we have from the world are, for example, Korea and Vietnam, which have been able to manage the disease without hard lockdowns. The other thing that I want to say is that developing countries are, part, are particularly vulnerable because of population density. People live in informal settlements, and I know even in Brazil it's there. People live in slums. And in, in, in these slums, you have high population densities. Even the houses themselves do not have any spatial dis distances, distancing. So effecting social distancing in these places is difficult. So in my view, what I think that developing countries can do, which are affordable, is one, accurate information. You need accurate information on the number of cases, on the number of tests that have been done on the mortalities. And information is not just in the numbers. You need to do mapping. So you map so that you know places which are hotspots and places which are not, because then this allows you to target your resources to places that really need them. And when you are targeting, it's not just about spatial targeting. It's also social targeting because there are people who are old, there are people who have other ailments, that if this, if, if this virus gets to them, it will be a problem. The third thing is that you need to use a community, existing community structures. And I know Kevin talked about a, a local administration, but you also have community-based organizations that have been involved in health. These can be people who are providing good information to the people in uh, it, 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 the people who actually need them. The other thing that I want to talk about is developing countries also need to encourage small companies to be innovative. For example, if there's a company, a small company that has been making furniture, now we are in a situation where people are not buying furniture. Can they be able to make mask, um, masks to, to, to help? You have people in informal sectors who've been, who've been in welding, welding beds, making, making metal beds. Can these people be involved in making the beds to help in hospitals and to help in, in other isolation centers? And the other thing that I want to talk about, you know, not everyone in these, in these developing countries can understand the, la the language that is coming from the government and the language that is coming from the minister. Some of them can better understand it in local languages. So can, uh, can the communication be translated to local languages so that you explain to people in informal settlements in the rural areas that this is what we are facing and this is, what we need, this is why we need to do social dis distancing. And particularly for the old people and the sick people who are in the rural areas, you also need to, to train the people who take care of them and explain to them, this is how you can give these people food 
this is why you need to give them space. This is why they, you should not visit them all the time. So I think those are some of the things that uh, developing countries can do and which are affordable. And then what I want to say again, this virus has shown that it doesn't matter so much how much money you, ha you have. It doesn't matter how so much the kind of healthcare that you have. It is time for people to work together without looking, without looking, with, without discrimination and without stigmatization. Somebody is not sick because they are poor. Somebody is not sick because they're uneducated. People are sick because the virus is affecting everyone. And then finally, I want to say that uh, again, from geography and from what we know, we know all of us are, are susceptible to this virus. At the moment, no one has the immunity for this virus. So all of us have the risk. And that is why all of us need to work together to find a solution. Thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe Kevin, just a quick thing. Yes. Yeah, I, I would just like to, to come back to the point that Claudia raised and that Francis just raised as well about uh, wanting to know where the virus actually is. It was just a study published yesterday in Lancet Infectious Diseases where the, uh, the two researchers did an estimate of how much of the actual reported, uh, how much of the number of the cases of COVID-19 in the world right now are actually reported. And the worldwide estimate they came up with was about 6%. They did this by calculating the, uh, uh, using some data from a couple of different studies, looking at the, the, the onset of symptoms in the time of, and the number of deaths reported. And they, they find that in, in Spain, for instance, where I am, that the number reported is maybe 1.7% of the total number of infections that are out there. In the United States, it's maybe 1.6%. Francis mentioned South Korea, which has done a good job of, of, uh, of containing the spread of this virus. And they've, they've detected nearly 50% of all the cases based on this particular model. So I think the issue, as Claudia was mentioning, that we don't have tests and we're using the tests for those people who are really very, very sick. Not that it's necessarily going to affect the, uh, affect the treatment course that much, but for some reason, it kind of reassures us to know that we're dealing with a COVID-19 patient as opposed to another patient. However, we need tests for the wide swath of the population so we know what exactly we are dealing with. We, don't, we, we have numerators, but we don't have any denominators yet for, all, for this. And it's frightening trying to figure out how you plan a coherent response when you don't really know what you're dealing with yet. We like to think that maybe COVID-19 isn't so profoundly affecting Africa yet, but I doubt that. The connections between Africa and China are far too, far too close and far too frequent to believe that somehow this virus bypassed Africa. I just think we're not, it's there and we're not finding it yet. If we were to test, we would be able to plan. Great, great, very good thing to note that the denominator is a problem. It's missing and we could be basing our policy on wrong numbers. So very critical. I, I want to invite Oscar from Zambia, uh, Lusaka. And I know you deal with numbers and informing policy. Uh, in another five or so minutes so that I have another 15 minutes to address questions from uh, the audience. What in your opinion is Africa's response? The way you're observing it now, is it adequate? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Um, unfortunately, I was uh, I had some challenges connecting, so I did not hear much of what uh, uh, Claudia was saying. But uh, Francis have raised very important points, especially in low-income countries. But um, uh, things that things about spatial and map, spatial distribution and mapping. In my own opinion, uh, what I think. Uh, governments, especially in low-income countries, should do is, uh, like Claudia said, to strengthen the primary health care. And one of the pillars of primary health care is health promotion, which most of the governments are already doing, um, but there are challenges in what they are doing, like uh, washing your hands with soap, sanitizing, and social distancing. The challenge, especially in, uh, uh, in, in, formal, in, in formal settlements, is when you tell the when you tell people to wash their hands and then there is no water, it is a challenge. They can't do it because there is no water, and therefore, what, in my opinion, the government should the government should should strategically place uh, water in, in in the in the informal settlements and including villages because most of the times we 
we forget about the rural areas. In the in 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 placing those uh, water and soap, so it cannot just be water. So the government should place water and soap in strategic areas as they, they are passing on the messages of washing hands with soap. Then that water and soap should be available. Uh, social distancing is very difficult, uh, especially in, in most of those uh, informal settlements. But there are some things that the government can control. When, when you, you cannot say a total lockdown because even inside the house is where they stay. It is so uh, crowded that putting them in lockdown in those houses is actually blowing up the problem. But government can control some things. For example, they can control the number of people enter into the market at, at, at some point. It can control the number of people either who are getting into public transport. It can also control people who are getting into shops, into the supermarkets and the shopping malls. So instead of governments doing a total lockdown in low-income countries, they can, they can restrict, they can kind of supervise uh, social distancing. Because putting in and enforcing it, uh, it's actually blowing up the problem. The other thing um, that I think should be done the government should encourage, and I think Francis has, has, has mentioned that this, this uh, local manufacturers, lo local um, entrepreneurs, to kind of uh, to start making face masks, uh, making sanitizers, and basically, the government can give incentives to them to to help them do that instead of uh, using a lot of money to import this from outside. Uh, the other thing. Um, that the government can do uh, to say get guard even the livelihoods of the of the produce of the local manufacturers. And of course, you know, in low-income countries, about 70% or more of, of the economy is driven by small businesses, right? So the government can can use uh, let me give you an example of in of social structures that are already in, in the communities. If you go to market, you find that they have some kind of social structure that they have. The government should government should work with those structures because they have leaders. For example, they have market leaders. They have they have both social and small income groupings. So the government can work with those people or those leaders to come up with 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 the, with the kind of uh, plans on how, for example, to do business. So if, if we have, if normally there are a lot of uh, marketeers, you can work with those groups to come up with a plan and do business on a rotational basis. And again, because you can use social protection so that you can also uh, cover the most vulnerable groups in those markets, small businesses, and also in the community. Yeah, so I think yeah. those are some of the things that yeah. come very, very, very great points, Mutinda. And, and this can go to you or to anyone in the group. Uh, one of the challenges of people being locked down or required to stay home, in most of these households, perhaps there's one, especially the male uh, head of the household will be the breadwinner. And what has been observed that there's increasing domestic violence, perhaps because there's a lot of pressure. Uh, what can be done to, to be able to address this matter, especially from a justice sector point? If I, if I, can, if I can go, uh, in the last week, there were reports that there have been uh, 12 homicides in UK because of, uh, because of lockdown. And I think people, what people need to appreciate is uh, this virus is not just a disease that is affecting health, but it's also affecting the mental state of people. So one thing that, we, that we, we, we've been thinking about with friends is that potentially for men, they hang out uh, and they don't come home a lot of times because of, uh, as a coping strategy. So after work, you go out to socialize instead of coming home early. Now the lockdown has ensured that, uh, has ensured that uh, people ha have to come home. 
and they have to come home and deal with the issues at home. So we also have to look at it as a, as a, as a mental and like you said, as a social justice point of view. So as much as all the resources are focused on addressing these uh, virus, uh, addressing the other mental health issues and ad ad addressing the security issues that may come with the, with the lockdowns is an important aspect. So all the police and all the security forces should not just be on the streets controlling people to move out of the streets, but other aspects of uh, justice should go on so that uh, no one should suffer at the moment just because there's a lockdown. Women should not suffer just because there's a lockdown. Uh, maybe for Claudia, you, you can also respond to something that uh, we have one of our followers or audience from uh, following us on YouTube. Ale we have Alessandra Aloni from Italy and she's asking, is there any plan for post-emergency once we are done with all this? How are we going to get all the skeleton handled? Some of these things Francis is mentioning. Can you repeat, please? <laughs> Uh, no problem. I'm asking, is there any plan being done by your municipality in Sao Paulo to prepare for the post emergency period? What will be done? Yes, uh, we have here um, about three hospital, uh, field hospitals, uh, extra uh, bed uh, cares, intensive cares, and uh, we are worried about um, uh, uh, the quickness. Uh, um, it's like uh, they spread so quickly, and uh, uh, we don't have prepared to to face this pandemic. Uh, uh, we are worried about uh, violence um, and children. Uh, we uh, we think that it's. Um, uh, high risk to the children uh, without school. Uh, the government is trying to um, uh, special attention uh, for disabilities, uh, accessible materials, um, survive and meet uh, the needs uh, for the children and the mothers and um, uh, not separate the mothers and babies. Uh, when uh, they are sick, like uh, uh, something uh, what happened with Ebola in Africa. Uh, um, uh, we have stress, uh, difficult living condition in limited space uh, because we have high uh, density of people uh, in, uh, around uh, the center of uh, Sao Paulo. And, and uh, 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 when the multiple, uh, multiple family members need to use the same space, space or computer, uh, Wi-Fi, recourses, uh, we have problem with the children and the girls. Uh, we are worried about that. Um, by the way, uh, the hospital care uh, is uh, a good preocupation. Um, uh, it's a good word about the government. We are worried about the uh, social determinants of health uh, that will um, okay. uh, coming uh, rapidly here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone wants to add to, especially also the post emergency. What what should we think about, Kevin? Would, you want to go? I, yeah, yes. I'd like to. I'd like to just offer an anecdote. The uh, even though I'm on the ground here in Spain for the last month and a half, I, I normally live in Switzerland. And the other day, I got a phone, a call on my phone, and it identified this person I did not know. And I looked up looked up to see who was calling me, and it was a psychotherapist. So not knowing why a psychotherapist would be calling me, I texted him back and he called me to say that he had been uh, um, asked by the commune where I live to contact all people in the commune who to see how everybody is coping 
with the restrictions of movement and being at home, just the way that, that Oscar was just talking about and Francis were talking about, checking in to see that everybody is doing okay. So not waiting for people to cry for help, but reaching out and saying, there is help if you're having trouble with it. Now, this of course is a, is a Switzerland, which is a country that's got a lot more resources, but it also has something in common with Africa, which is that it has a real community spirit. The villages in Switzerland are, are very cohesive. And uh, like in Africa, I think the opportunity is there for organizations that have been dealing with other problems, other pressing issues in these communities to be engaged, to look out for the people in those communities. It's not a model that requires money, it's a model that requires community spirit. And that exists in great, great amounts in many areas in Africa. Thank you. It reminds me in countries like Kenya, Rwanda, uh, I think Uganda to an extent, there's been the Nyumbakumi structure. 10 households. So for every 10 households, there is someone who represents them. I think this is the time to activate that and make it really work. Be able to identify who is more vulnerable, uh, ensure that they have access to food. I would imagine even in a village, even in the city, if we have every 10 households knowing that this person has been living with a condition, you know, maybe they have lived with HIV and, and uh, they will need extra care be kept away the households around will arrange and bring food to this person so that they don't have to go out. Uh, you know, we, we can map out and also have a response system where a phone call can be made There's an emergency line. I know this doesn't work very well in most of, of uh, developing countries, but if we will know that there's a representative who can connect with a community health worker. So I, I think there's real opportunity in making use of the primary healthcare system linked to the social protection systems that many times do not need even extra investment. All they need is to how to link them to a referral uh, mechanism. Yeah, maybe Mutinda, you can say something on that as we, we, we wind up and I'll be scanning out for any question from our audience. Um, Mutinda, and then everyone can go along and just you are, you're your parting shot. Thank you, uh, true. Um, uh, most, most let, me, let me talk about uh, the gender based violence and uh, uh, even before the, the COVID-19 came around, most of the you know, low-income countries, uh, GDP was was very uh, was was there, and most uh, some of the causes of uh, gender-based violence uh, are, are, are cultural, they are social, and they are also uh, economic. So, like you were saying, post-COVID-19, I think, uh, and like Kevin has said, all the organizations that have been dealing with the GBV should be active very much right now on the lookout on the most of the people who are most vulnerable um, and, and, and try to come up with strategies on how to deal with, uh, with the issue, uh, uh, such as uh, trying to identify the issues. If it's, it's a social issue, uh, like you're saying, there's so, so many things in the community, like, for example, someone was, uh, let's say, it's, uh, so it's as a chronic illness. Uh, for example, HIV, and the neighbors don't know. And uh, right now, since they are at home and everyone is there, then they they, they might notice that yeah, this guy uh, is on uh, takes medicine for HIV or, or some other chronic illness, and that can actually highly impact on his uh, mental health. So it's it's very important that these things are mapped out right now and I identified. And then strategies then are put into place yeah. on how to address them now and even after COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Mutinda. Uh, Francis, do you want to go? Your parting shot also? Yeah, uh, I have three things that I want to say. I think the developing countries, particularly those in Africa, have the advantage that uh, the virus has hit their borders late. And so there are lessons that they can learn from how other countries have handled this. And I think one thing that uh, developing countries need to do is to contextualize the interventions, contextualize the interventions according to the realities of your country. Uh, the second thing that I want to say again about developing countries, they may lack resources, they may lack, they may lack the income resources, they may lack the medical care, but they are good in social capital. And this is something that can help at this particular time. Like the example that has been given, 
if uh, I have uh, some means and uh, I have a few relatives who are not well at this particular time, if I can provide them with food for a day so that they don't have to go out, that is something that can help at this particular time. So social capital is very important. The final thing that I want to say that this, this virus has been a challenge, but it is also a learning moment. The model, the current model where the current model of inequality where you get medical services because you have the money for it or you 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 get certain uh, social services because you are able to pay for them cannot work is not sustainable this virus has taught us that we need to work together and again it has taught the uh, the governments of developing countries that it is time to locally produce some essential items that you need for your people at this particular time, you may have the money to buy masks, but uh, the supply chains have been cut. It is, uh, and then again, the other thing that we've been able to learn, the informal sector is very important. The informal sector is very important. There are jobs that you can do, uh, you can do without, but there are jobs in the informal sector that you cannot do without. So it is important to protect these sectors that are very vital. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Claudia, do you want to do your parting shots? Uh, we are discussing um, about um, homemade masks uh, for everybody here. Uh, Sao Paulo is a great city, uh, 11 million of people. And uh, we are recommending to walk in and uh, get out with uh, our um, homemade masks because it's so difficult to get uh, the supplies that we need to to buy or do masks here in brazil and we have problems with the uh, with this uh, i think that uh, here we have um um, um in we the lost you yes. uh, the community uh, agent health uh, uh, to help the population with in need, um, I suppose that it's a great uh, goal to equality uh, in, in this pandemic. Uh, I love the community agents; uh, they are so great. Uh, but um, uh, we need to uh, talk in simple language. It's too important to understand and learn how to do and um, support uh, one pandemic. Uh, the social media is so tragic. Uh, it's, um, a journalist is not good for the population. Um, uh, I think that we have to learn to talk in simple language with the community agents uh, to do a good job. And uh, uh, mental uh, problems, uh, it's um, a new problem in this pandemic with uh, social isolation. Here in Brazil, we have inequalities that uh, we don't know how to do uh, and uh, what is the consequence uh, yet. We are learning too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kevin? Yeah, just I trying to be optimistic and think about this. The response from China and from Europe and now from the United States where this is hit has been largely a, a top down government driven response. I think there's an opportunity in Africa where community resources are so well ingrained and so well utilized heavily exercised after three decades of dealing with HIV in, in the continent that uh, there's an opportunity for a different model. A model that, uh, I mean, none of these models so far have been particularly effective at stemming the epidemic. But the model that's being used in, in Europe and the model in the United States and in China is not gonna work well in Africa. But it could well be that the model in Africa may work well in these other communities as well once they see how it can be done. So I'm optimistic that in many ways, Africa may be, be able to lead the way. Great. 
Thank you, thank you. This this has been really a, a great conversation. I, I think, and you may remind me if, I'm, if I forgot some key messages here. One, that it's not purely a medical issue. Uh, social justice has to be a primary uh, component of, of, of this intervention. That also governments, especially in, in low income settings, we must appreciate that we don't have the proper denominator. So rushing to do certain measures such as lockdown uh, may be ill-advised because we do not even have the, the, the proper numbers that, that we are talking about. Uh, that again, no one can say this is not a problem for, uh, for some communities or some races. Uh, everyone is vulnerable, as Francis has put it, and perhaps it's just the dynamics in which uh, this has been. And it's no longer a problem of those who fly around the world because it's got into the community level. Uh, but again, like uh, Claudia has mentioned, let's keep very simple messages. Uh, let's not complicate it. Uh, but also think about uh, how do we create innovation uh, so that the local industry, uh, I think it's reminded us that every country must be able to have some bare minimum on, on how it takes care of its needs. We can't rely on China only. Uh, so we've got to do that. Uh, again, that we can't forget in this context is that uh, you must protect human rights, uh, that girls, women are more and more vulnerable. Uh, it looks like communities have not been having real conversations. You know, it looks like even married couples will, lay, will stay together for 50 years or more, but I've never had real conversations about their issues. So perhaps it's time to really think about families. How do we enhance even beyond this family as a primary uh, level of protecting human beings, whether it's from epidemics like this or, or from social issues and economic issues. Uh, and, 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 and I think very important then, uh, as, as we've said, we've got to understand that we need each other. Uh, so I think this will strengthen uh, the SDG goal of, of partnerships that we do need each other and that a response cannot be uh, limited to a certain area and expect that the, that the other one is safe. So no one is safe until we are all safe. There's that saying in Ubuntu, you know, you heard about the Ubuntu. Uh, I, I am as safe as you are. My children will be as well as your children are. So don't think about only your only place and keep it there. Uh, I think to me, those were the key things. In case I forgot something very critical, panelists, feel free to shout it. Great, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I believe uh, this YouTube link will be available, it will be shared with others who are not able to attend. Uh, we'll try and put this in a, in, in a write-up and, and try and get it out to more of the decision makers, do some open letters to government. I believe this is very critical. Okay, thank Sam, you very yes. much. Yes, Sam, before you, I, there are quite a number of questions on YouTube. I don't know if you've oh, been able to ahead. call all of them. So um, the some are posted in the chat uh, window. And uh, there are quite a couple that have just come in. Um, so there's a question um, about strengthening the sense of community from Julian, and also uh, the the role of CSOs and fun and donors uh, in uh, in combating GBV. Uh, I don't know if someone can be able to talk about those two strengthening systems. Uh, and the role of civil society organizations. Okay, any thoughts? Um, the role of civil society, are we doing enough? Let me ask Oscar to answer that. I think you're closer in daily work with civil society. Yeah, um, I, I think going back to what uh, someone you've mentioned about, uh, this is the time to look, about, uh, look at the family. This is the time to to see um, what we can do as a unit, as a family. The CSOs and the organizations that champion child rights and uh, human rights and women rights have the opportunity now that people are together uh, to have this conversation of protecting the rights of the vulnerable in the communities, especially the children and women. Uh, it, 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 it's, right, it's, right, it's the right time now since everyone is here is kind of uh, staying at home. Uh, when I say staying at home is, I'm talking about communities now being closer together uh, because of, the, of this virus. And so the CSOs and the, the organizations that uh, are championing these rights, I think they have, they have an opportunity now to start the conversations 
and, and, and shift the dialogue in the community and talk about the family and the rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other thoughts, or, uh, especially uh, Jennifer, the other question was was from Perina, I think in Kenya. Uh, that's the question from Perina on CSOs. Julian, I think also from Kenya, was asking uh, the question of partnership uh, and also emphasizing the messaging by civil society. Uh, has it been effective? Uh, anyone can respond to the question of effectiveness in the messaging. Uh, Claudia, you've touched on it. Do you want to say something around it? Um, uh, we worked here with uh, communication in public health. Here, I have my partner. Hi, everybody. Bruno, nice journalist, dentist, and uh, we, we work with communication uh, to help, to help um, uh, municipal uh, uh, departments and uh, uh, we learn um, in a few years to be simple it's not easy because we are technicists um, try to do uh, uh, to break the wall and the technical language and simple language it's too important um, uh, we have to reshape ourselves all the time, all the time, because the people need to understand what is the most important um, care um, in this pandemic. Now we are trying to, to do pills, little pills of views, uh, films with messages to um, uh, public health and people. Uh, uh, who needs the care. Uh, we will produce something like a homemade masks, a wash hands, uh, what do you need to survive uh, violence, uh, uh, children. We have to talk with uh, our people. Uh, we are trying. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's a good learning for us. Uh, uh, we are uh, every time we shape ourselves. Thank you. I, I know, Kevin, you've worked at uh, global level WHO, again, from what you'll expect of civil society, adequate response, inadequate. I think that um, so far, it, uh, everybody's still trying to catch their breath and figure out what to do. I think it's too soon to judge how adequate the civil society response has been. I think going forward, we'll see more. But as of the moment right now, I think there are elements of, uh, of good work starting to take place, but it's, most, it's hard to get good work done like this when everybody is you know, locked down at home or afraid to go to the office or, or not knowing what they can do and what they can't do. So it goes back to what Claudia is saying. People need clear, simple messages. But I think you know we're human beings. We adapt to these things. We're going to accommodate. And when we do, I'm pretty sure the response is going to be good. And I, somebody had mentioned the donors. I think it's too soon for the donors even to figure out what they should be supporting and what they're doing. They're also all working from home for the most part in their donor capitals around the world. So I, you know, we, we're, it's too, we're premature judging them yet, but I have hope. Thank you. Francis, any thought on civil society, current stakeholders and response overall? I think what I, what I wanted to say in that question was about community strengthening, because uh, at the moment, it's the, the governments that are communicating to the people. For the people in, 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 in uh, low-income countries, developing countries, poor people normally see the government to be coercive. So when the government says there's a lockdown, people just hide because they know the government is going to be coercive. I think what this calls is uh, for us to develop community response mechanism where a community, like you said, the Nyumbakumi, a community can have a local, a, a local community team that is in charge of uh, surveillance, that is in charge of uh, reporting, that is in charge of even actualizing the initial, the, the initial isolations, provided they have the right, the, the right training 
if it is done at the community level, explained in a vernacular language that people can understand, then potentially the response is likely to be better. Because at the moment, there are people who do not even get what the government is saying correctly. I remember yesterday I had to explain to people in Kenya, uh, some, some women who are selling things, I had to explain to them what, what, the, what the president meant by moving in and moving out of, of, of the city. So I, I think having a community response uh, is, is not strong enough, but it's something that will help us even in future. Thank you. I now have indulged all of you beyond the, the time we had set. I really want to appreciate that. But I think what is coming again from all this is do not do a complete lockdown. It's, you will cause more damage the, than it is. Go. I, I like what Kevin said. There's no one approach that works for everyone. Uh, and maybe Africa or developing countries for that matter will also show us that you can do a community driven approach to this, which I think will be much more sustainable uh, and, and then brings in the partnership of civil society groups to then strengthen those systems uh, rather than waiting for the government and, and applying uh, the government reactions. Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I'm sorry, there's another question. Just look at the quest at the chat box. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm just conscious of how much time we had asked. Uh, let's see. Uh, drawing from the mantra, uh, from those whom much is given, much is required. This is especially so for the wealthy in Africa. So uh, what's the question there, uh, Jennifer? Whether there should be more philanthropies from the local community? Is that the question? Jennifer? Yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe in the interest of time, I, I think building again from just what we have said that uh, you, let's do a community, a top, a bottom up approach to this. Uh, I think it will work, especially for low income setting. It will make people feel more dignified. Uh, I think uh, having human rights or, or rather accessing life and, and uh, access to services without dignity really has no meaning. Even when you look at the WHO, uh, parameter for responsiveness of an intervention or a policy. Dignity is very, very critical. Let people not feel like they're, they have not been respected in all this. It's not going to help us in the long term. Uh, so a lot of lessons here for, for the low income setting, a lot of very practical things we can do. I really want to appreciate this panelist for this. Thank you very much. Once again, Asante Sana. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, can I? Yes. We have your excuse about our president's words. Uh, it's not what we think when we are working uh, for do our best. Sorry. <laughs> no, that, that, that's true. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I think the, the, the challenge for anyone responding to COVID is you can find yourself so much drawn to protecting lives from a, a health model or so much drawn to protecting the livelihoods. And I think that's where the Brazilian president perhaps is very concerned. And I think in the early times, we, that was almost the signals we got from Trump also and other world leaders that look, businesses must continue. Uh, but it's true, you must save lives fast. But how are you saving life is really the question. So I, I think it's, it's really an opportunity for the different, the two people in the different sides of, of this to, to come together and say, here is the middle ground so that we save lives and we also save livelihoods. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Morning, bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye bye.